today's meeting for City Mass and YouTube channel. Clerk, may I have a roll call, please? Here. All right. Um, board, have you had an opportunity to review the minutes from the February 21st, 2023 meeting? If so, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes. I have reviewed the minutes, and I make a motion to approve the minutes as printed. Any discussion, comments? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. Moving on to claims. I've reviewed the uh, claims and uh, I make a motion we accept the claims as printed. I'll second the motion to approve the claims. Any comments or questions? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. On unfinished business, we do have the absence of uh, board member Carlo for a death in the family, so we'll keep the fire department SOPs tabled and she will have a conversation afterwards. Thank you. All right, moving on to new business. Uh, Brian Jackson, our utility director, has a request for approval of SRF disbursement requests 12, 13, and 14. Yeah, we have uh, three requests uh, for the three contractors for divisions A, B, and C. Joe, you just want me to go through all three and then we'll approve them one time or? Okay. All right, the first one is uh, SRF request number 12 for uh, Dave O'Mara contracting, uh, work at the water treatment plant. Uh, the total amount of the invoice was $74,460. Uh, the retainage amount is $3,723. The amount to be paid to uh, Dave O'Mara contracting by the SRF will be $70,737. Uh, the next one, uh, SRF request number 13 to uh, MW Coal Construction for the water storage tank work. Uh, the total amount of the invoice is uh, $90,450. Uh, the retainage amount will be rounded to $4,523 for the SRF. And the amount paid uh, to MW Coal Construction from the SRF will be $85,928. And uh, thirdly, the re request number 14 uh, for the water main replacements for Brackney Incorporated. Uh, the total amount of that invoice is uh, $1,268,924.47. Uh, the retainage amount for that invoice will, will be $63,446. And the amount paid uh, to Brackney by the SRF will be $1,205,478. And it's uh, the first Two, like I said, were A, Elmira was A, MW Cole was B, and Brackney was Division C. And you're happy with this, this first one right now? And yes, yes. We, we had a construction meeting last week uh, to go over everything that transpired so far. Plus, not only do we have to be happy once we approve it, the SRF will review what has been completed so far, and they'll make sure or they won't pay them either. Okay, so. Yeah, so two, we two, check two, it and they check it. Okay. okay, and you're okay with the retainage amount being? Yes, that's, that's a percentage of whatever we're doing. That, that's, that's a flat percentage. Okay. So it's always gonna be a whatever percent of what they pay or what there's to get. Well, I'll make a motion then we approve uh, all the uh, projects we have one, two, and three uh, request payments. I'll second the motion. Any comments or questions? Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, thank you. Thank you. Brian, thank you. Thank you, Rob. Moving on, Chief Washer, we have a request here for senior firefighter status. You want to describe that? Yes, sir. In the packet that uh, you received, uh, you received a cover lever uh, stating that two firefighters, one from Station 5, one from Station 2, have requested senior status. Uh, for the mention uh, in the cover letter, I would request that you grant their request. They do meet the 
standards for senior status. Both have done good jobs, stations, yes, over the yes, years. Yes, they've carried different places. Each one of them have um, had numerous uh, and different uh, jobs or offices at each station. And one up until last year was, uh, well, both, as a matter of fact, as until last year were actually uh, driver operators also. Yeah. Nice careers. Uh, which stations are these four? Is it two? And what was the other one? Five. Two and station five. Station two and station five. Okay. Well, I make a motion to accept the letters for the uh, firefighters to receive senior status. Uh, I second the motion and also thank them for their service, um, their active service to each of these volunteer fire departments. Any discussion, comments, or questions? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Chief, thank you very thank much. You. Keep up a good job. All right, now we'll move into some resolutions. Joe? Resolution 6B-2023, a resolution of the Board of Public Works and Safety closing a portion of the alley for the grand opening of the Chandler Hotel. Whereas there's been a request filed by Matt Chandler on behalf of the Chandler Hotel for permission to close a portion of the alley east of the hotel located at 111 East 2nd Street in conjunction with the hotel's grand opening activities. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Public Works and Safety of the City of Madison, Indiana, that the following alley shall be closed on April 27, 2023, from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. The alley located east of the Chandlery Hotel, Chandler Hotel, and running north and south <coughs> from 2nd Street from Hein to Heinz Lane. Be it further resolved by the Board of Public Works and Safety of the City of Madison, Indiana, that said alley as closed shall be in the supervision and control of the Chandler Hotel. I'd like to introduce yourself. Uh, Matt Chandler with the Chandler Hotel. Matt, thanks for being here today. Tell us a little bit about the Chandler okay, and the so event that will happen on the 27th. Sure. So we're the boutique hotel located over on 2nd Street, and the grand opening is scheduled to be the 27th. And from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m., we would just like to be able to host people with cocktail tables in the alley um, from the lobby of the hotel if they want to have drinks or hors d'oeuvres, things like that. We're expecting about 200 to 250 people during the duration of the event. So. We just think for safety concerns as well, it might be simpler just to keep the, that closed during that duration of time. If uh, Describe the Chandler a little bit, thanks. I want okay. the community to really, I know there's a lot of buzz about it already. Okay. And uh, the pictures are beautiful. And, Thank you. And you've given me a tour, so I know how wonderful it is. But tell <laughs> the community a little bit about it, Matt. So uh, we are a boutique hotel, a truly boutique. Each room is basically <coughs> designed and curated to showcase Madison, some of the landmarks in Madison, uh, the history of Madison and the building that used to be a livery stable and a bottling works over there on 2nd Street. Um, we'll have a lobby, we'll have a rooftop terrace and a fitness room. It's Indiana's first invisible service hotel, which means basically you, we uh, logged in automatically through self check-in. You'll get an individualized code upon booking that will be synced to your guest room. Um, and then uh, service is never more than a screen touch away with a text message or an email. And we'll respond to any inquiries that way, but it's exclusive to our guests. So it's not like, you know, general public just can't walk in. If you're booked there, you're staying there, you're, you have access to all those amenities um, yourself. And when will be the actual opening? Well, we're, we're ironing out the website this week. I hope to go live next week with um, reservations uh, through our direct booking website, and then we'll also be, guests will be able to book through Airbnb as well. So, well, yeah. thank, you for really making, thank you for making the investment. We're excited about the, uh, the ribbon cutting and grand opening. I'll make a motion to approve uh, resolution 6B for the street closure for the Chandler Hotel grand opening. I'll second the mayor's motion. Any discussion? Comments or questions? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Let us know if you need anything, Matt. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, moving on. Resolution of the Board of Public Works and Safety of the City of Madison, Indiana regarding street closing for the Jefferson County Public Library. Whereas there has been a request filed by Kara Montsinger on behalf of the Jefferson County Public Library for a street closing in connection with their Touch a Truck Summer Reading Kickoff to be held on Tuesday, June 6, 2023. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Public Works and Safety of the City of Madison, Indiana 
that the southbound lane and northbound lanes of Broadway Street from the north side of Main Street to the south side of 3rd Street shall be closed from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. on Tuesday, June 6, 2023. Be further resolved by the Board of Public Works and Safety of the City of Madison, Indiana, that said street as closed shall be under supervision and control of the Jefferson County Public Library at the times noted above for the year 2023. Thank you. Is Kara here? Yes. Oh, yeah, come on up, Kara. I think we did this last year, didn't we? We did. Yeah. Yes. So we'll describe a little bit about the event and uh, also share with us all the great things that are happening at the library. All right. Um, well, I'm the children's librarian, and so every year at the Jefferson County Public Library, we like to have a kickoff event to try and get all the kids interested, all the families um, signed up for Summer Reading Club. So it's for all ages, it's open to everyone in our community, and um, we have a kickoff. And so Touch a Truck is really unique in that it is um, a really awesome outdoor program where we invite lots of different vehicles to come. And a lot of times they're city vehicles, but we have um, other vehicles that come and visit as well. And they would come and park on the street um, and their vehicles are usually turned off and then the kids can, the kids and families can walk around to all those different vehicles um, and talk to the people who get to drive them every day. And sometimes uh, they're able to sit in those vehicles. And so that's kind of what touch a truck is. Um, and uh, that's our kickoff for summer reading. Summer reading lasts all summer long, June and July. Um, and we're starting, actually, um, they can start reading June 1st, but on June 6th, we really wanna do the big push to get everybody signed up and started reading for the program, and they can earn prizes and uh, free books for doing reading um, all summer long. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is just kind of the kickoff for that, but we're also planning on having Kona Ice come to the Touch a Truck. Um, and it's just um, a two hour event from 10 until noon. Um, but since we're gonna be um, like in a very heavily uh, used area that's, um, we want it to be somewhere that's familiar to people. So that's why we uh, chose to try and have it at the fountain instead of on Elm Street. Cause in the past we've used Elm Street, um, but that's problematic um, for a couple of reasons. Um, then people can't really park to come in the library. And then also, um, we don't want kids crossing a lot of busy streets. So um, a lot of times people are familiar with downtown. They know where they can park to get close uh, to the fountain safely. Um, so that's kind of, it really worked out great to have it on, uh, by, the, by the fountain. So. Uh, has Chase and Marshall from the Paw Patrol been invited yet to attend this event? I think the kids would they love that. They haven't, but we would love to have them. If you could reach out to Chief Washer back there and maybe coordinate, I think that'd be a, uh, a great time for them and also help enhance your event. Absolutely. I'll make a motion that we approve uh, Resolution 7B 2023 for the street closure associated with the Jefferson County Public Library event. Uh, second the mayor's motion. Any discussion? I believe last year the Walnut Street Fire Department green truck was the most popular. Is that correct? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. <laughs> He's only saying that because his colleague from the number threes over <laughs> no, here no, no. is not here today. <laughs> anyway, thanks for having me again. We're happy to participate too. So, uh, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kara. Take care. It's a resolution of the Board of Public Works and Safety of the City of Madison, Indiana regarding a street closing for the Life Choices Clinic Walk for Life. Whereas there's been a request filed by Lisa Perry on behalf of Life Choices Clinic for street closings in connection with the Life Choices Clinic Walk for Life to be held on Saturday, May 6, 2023. Now, therefore, be resolved by the Board of Public Works and Safety of the City of Madison, Indiana that Vaughn Drive from J.C. Park to Vernon Street shall be closed from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. on Saturday, May 6, 2023. Be it further resolved by the Board of Public Works and Safety of the City of Madison, Indiana, that said street as closed shall be under the supervision and control of Life Choices Clinic at the times noted above for the year 2023. Is uh, Lisa here? Okay. I think this is an annual event that we've done, um, and it was moved to J.C. Park. I'll make a motion, uh, even in her absence, that we approve Resolution 8B 2023 for the Choices Clinic, uh, Life Choice Clinic, Walk for Life. I second the mayor's motion. Any discussion? I assume she'll work with the street department and get the side streets barricaded and mm -hmm. the ones coming in the long drive. Right. Yep, we'll look at it. Safety protocols and the event plan. Any discussion, comments, or questions? 
Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. All right. Uh, next, we have a request for a handicapped parking space at the corner of 1st and Craigmont. Morning, board. We received a request for a uh, handicapped parking space. Uh, it's being the rear of 1001 West 2nd, which are correct, 1st and Craigmont, be the north west corner. That is the uh, Tower Apartments. There are no currently handicapped parking spots on the back side. There is on the front side. I mean the front side, I mean on second, but none on first. Uh, there are some handicapped parking spaces in their private lot for, for the residents, but uh, for some reason it seems like you know, the, the parking on the street is uh, much more, I guess, uh, accommodating for them than, than, than parking in the, in the rear lot. I'm not sure what the configuration is or what the issue is, but uh, I did receive that request. Uh, seeing no handicapped parking spaces there. Um, is that, you said north of you say northwest corner? It's northwest corner. Of first, okay, this uh, first is northeast. And, okay, so it's the northwest corner. Northwest, did I say northeast? No, no. No, yeah, okay. it would be the northwest corner of first and uh, Craigmont, where this is actually located on the south side of the apartments. Okay. And it's just one or two? How many? Uh, the uh, person who lives there requested it, uh, Mrs. Sargent, uh, requested on the, at that location. Uh, I think it may have been her understanding initially that that would be her parking spot, but as I explained to her, that would be available to anybody that qualify, qualifies for handicap and has the placard. So, um, you know, I don't foresee that being an issue there. There is none on the backside. Uh, that is a, uh, as a, I think, a senior residence area, so that would uh, be my recommendation to uh, ask the board to approve that request. I'll make a motion we approve the uh, request for handicap parking. Uh, before I get to his his motion, the parking uh, for the Riverside Tower lofts was part of a plan commission parking plan that included on street and off street parking, and I'd be hesitant to amend that plan without first working with the planning department to see if. You know, a unilateral action by the board here for uh, a uh, handicapped parking somehow impacts their plan. Uh, if we could perhaps table this, take it under advisement uh, until the next meeting, we can work with our planning commission and evaluate the plan that's on file for parking for Riverside Tower Lofts and determine if this would impact that plan at all. Chief, that would be the no, only the, the input was, here. That yeah, place. that's yeah. the implication with changing the, typically on street parking wouldn't be an issue, but when it's part of a parking plan that's approved by part, the plan commission for a residential development like that, we should just make sure we're connecting all the dots if yeah. that's well, okay. It, it so. appears they did a really good job with uh, striping off, uh, you know, especially on first street on the south side of, you know, four, parking for the residents uh, but yeah it's parking on the street down there is definitely at a premium uh, and we may even entertain the thought of maybe doing that on Craigmont Street in the 200 block maybe striping the individual parking spaces off there to you know to kind of tighten things up a little bit sometimes you get you know just, nice just, gaps but not enough yeah. gap to park another vehicle yeah but just be just keep in mind that there's a parking plan yes. that was approved with that development so anything we do on on street around that uh, would, would potentially impact that parking plan. And I think we just need to coordinate with the planning department to make sure it doesn't impact sure. any approvals they receive through the planning commission. Okay. I'll so if we could. Uh, I can amend my motion to uh, just table it then for sure. the next okay. meeting. We have an amended motion to table this, to research the uh, plan commission parking plan. I'll second that. Any additional discussion? No. Comments or questions? Chief, thank you. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Well, thank you, Chief. Okay, we're going to um, move into a hearing now. We'll move into a hearing on the order to demolish or remove multiple unsafe structures on Mo Moody Park Lane. Right now, I'd like to uh, ask our building inspector, Landon Ralston, our code enforcement officer, Dewey O'Neill, uh, to present the findings.
Good morning. So 421 Mobile Home Park located on parcels at uh, 390, 330, or 938, 940 Walnut Street. Uh, it recently flooded in June 18, 2021 and it suffered what's considered a category three water damage, which comes from flash floods. So the materials in the mobile home that were that absorbed the flood water are toxic and did have damaging bacteria from flood water. Uh, these materials are gypsum board, MFD board. Those materials soak up water and cannot be dried out without weakening the fire and strength rating. So wall, wall, ca wall cavities will hold mold if not removed. Uh, so when I inspected these structures in August, uh, all but one of the ones that we're talking about today were vacant. So in order to recover from a flood, you had to dry out the mobile home as soon as possible, decontaminate the mobile home as soon as possible. And like I said before, materials that are almost never salvageable because they cannot be contaminated, decontaminated our sheet, sheet rock insulation and MDF board. So mobile 421 mobile home park is in a floodplain. Uh, I'm not trying to, can you tell us exactly which units you're making a request on or are you gonna get to that? I'm gonna get to it. Okay, I apologize. In just a second, Joe. Okay, good deal. 421 Mobile Home Park is in a floodplain. A floodplain is defined as an area joining a river stream that has been or may be covered by floodwaters. So I see 36-7-4-1019, which is remedies, enforcement, non-conforming use of variance, burden of proof, reconstruction of non-conforming structures, permitted and conditions, and certain reconstruction that is not authorized. Since 421 Mobile Home Park is uh, in the historic district, it is a non-conforming structure and it cannot be repairs, reconstruction cannot be made since it's in a floodplain. Um, the units that we are talking about today are 401, 407, 408, 413, 414, 419, and 420 Moody Park Lane. So some of the violations that we saw during our visit, this, this is for all of them, expose electrical cables, uh, insufficient service panel clearance, open front or open face receptacles, inadequate water supplies, inadequate sewage disposal, improper connections to the sewer system, inadequate smoke detectors, blocked exits, improper maintenance, improper use of extension cords, improper water heater insulation and missing G GFCIs in bathrooms and <clears throat> kitchens. So the first one, 421 Mobile Home Park. And all of the unsafe determination is from our unsafe building law or unsafe uh, um, unsafe building chapter 145.103. The letters referenced here correspond with the unsafe building law or unsafe building chapter in the uh, city city code. Uh, so to start off 401 mobile home park, C stock talks about structure, structural. So frame anchors, uh, that's ICC AE 604.1 and 410 IAC 6-611. Um, so whether they have them or not, they've been in a flood, the owner must prove that they have a capable, capable of resisting allowance working load of 3,150 pounds. <clears throat> so H would uh, be talking about exposed equipment. So we have open electrical boxes, we have uh, open junction boxes, we have uh, service panel not accessible, service panel not installed correctly. Um, Ken Washer is going to come up and speak in a minute about the fire hazards of those. Uh, broken windows, um, repairs made on, so each one of my, each one of these right here, let's see, let's get to this. So unsafe building sections uh, under our unsafe building law, C, H, K, L, N, and O. So our, that's the violations. 
that's what made them unsafe. And then we went in a little bit further and uh, went through exposed cables, windows broken, repairs made on non-conforming structures, subfloors, floors not properly repaired, and faulty sanitary drain lines, smoke detectors, insufficient fire blocking. Any questions about the first one? The, but this was this one occupied or unoccupied at the time of your this inspection? one was unoccupied at my at the first time of my visit but occupied on my second visit okay and was your second visit and I think you're probably going to get to this when you received the collect or the uh, inspection warrant from yes. the court yes. okay <clears throat> Four hundred seven Moody Park Lane. It was unoccupied uh, during my August visit, and when we visited in February, it was occupied. So you can see the black mold in the walls. Insufficient water supplies. Insufficient sanitary lines. Uh, the the uh, occupants are using a bucket for the bathroom. Uh, you have an exposed electrical box. This, uh, this unit had a cord running from 401 to power 407. So there was not, the power wasn't on on this one. You have open, open face electrical boxes, open panels, open floors. So for Moody Park Lane, 407, so insufficient emergency exit routes, frame anchors, uh, fire blocking had been removed, um, exposed cables, insufficient service panel clearance, open front receptacles, broken windows, repairs made on non-conforming structures. In the floodplain, subfloor, floors not properly repaired, faulty sanitation drain lines, and smoke detectors. Any questions on this one? Hmm? He will. 408. Um, this one. This one was abandoned. Also, uh, they had started demolition on this. I'm not sure what the plans were to finish it or remodel it. But again, it's a mobile home, non-conforming structure located in a floodplain, which reconstruction repairs are not permitted. Clearly, that one was unoccupied when you did your inspection? Yes. Okay. Unoccupied as well. So, insufficient emergency exits, frame makers, broken windows, exposed wiring, insufficient fire blocking, the means of egress, egress are screwed shut. This one, again, this one was vacant. There, the floor repairs. Any questions on 413? Uh, did Do all of these uh, mobile homes have the frame anchors or or is the concern they're not capable of resisting allowable you know, working load? Are some of them missing the frame anchors? Since they've been through a flood, they need to be tested to see if they are. Some of them are missing, yes. Some are, okay, some are missing, and some are there, need to be tested, okay. Okay. 414. Uh, frame anchors, and uh, again, it's only on there because it's been through a flood. It needs to be proven that they are capable of resisting an allowable working load of at least 3,150 pounds. And this one, this is 414? It is, it is occupied. It was not occupied when I visited in August. 
And is that a wooden porch structure that provides access to the to the to the mobile home? Yes. Okay. But no egress access. So we have exposed cables, uh, insufficient receptacles, exposed electrical panel, uh, insufficient service panel clearance insufficient fire blocking. We're 19. This one was occupied. So So 419. Yes. Okay, occupied. Occupied. What was the access structure uh, connected to the trailer? The porch, is that a wooden yeah. porch? Yes. Okay. So we have uh, exposed cables. We had uh, leaky waste lines, leaking waste lines. We have mold. Uh, insufficient service panel access, not properly installed. Broken windows. Um, and again, all these all these uh, violations come from our unsafe building law. This one, the owner let me in while I was putting in putting up stop work orders. So she had told me that she had been living there two months and uh, had just received uh, water two days prior to me visiting. And this is something that the Indiana Department of Health mobile home parks uh, monitors is having sufficient water supply and waste lines. 420 Mo Moody Park Lane. Uh, occupied. So leaks in the plumbing system. Uh, exposed cables, exposed electrical panel, not sufficient clearance. Inadequate in, in fire blocking, and let's see what else here. And that's it on that one. Ken, Ken did the inspection with me, so he is here for uh, fire safety. Just to back up what Landon said, <clears throat> I did not see any working detectors in any of the structures. We did have floor sections out of some of the structures. Very poor electric, not to code. One thing that would concern me greatly, my major concern, is the lack of detectors with the open places in the floor, uh, an incipient or beginning stage fire would not only draw air from its ambient around itself in the room, but it would also draw it through the openings in the floor. That fire would click quickly engulf that entire trailer. Those are the major things as fire. There is no fire blocking in those trailers. It will go from one end to the other rapidly. Thank you. So my conclusion with the repairs that would need to be made, would, con would be considered substantial improvements. But they would not be permitted because of Indiana Code. Thirty six seven four 1019 
non-conforming structures, reconstruction not authorized, located within a floodplain. And with its recent flood in June 18th, 2021, um, the impact that a flood water is due to a mobile home with the MDF board, the gypsum board, the wall cavities, that would, that would be considered substantial improvements, not to mention the electrical systems and everything else that would require improvement. Uh, on a uh, floodplain or a floodway management note, uh, the ground elevation at Moody Park is 477.8 feet. The base flood elevation is 482.7 feet. What was, the, what was the last number? Four what? 482.7. Okay. As long as you did go with a new structure, it would have to be elevated structure? Yes. At least eight foot off the ground. Uh, do you have another slide with your conclusions in it? I know you probably went through them, but... I do not have another slide. Would you mind reading each each bullet point of your conclusions, please? In Absolutely. The so 421 Mobile Park, Mobile Home Park, like I said earlier, was flooded June 18th, 2021. Exteriors were inspected on August 25th, 2022 by me, the building inspector, and Dewey O'Neill. The owner was notified of the unsafe, set, unsafe status on September 8th, 2022. All but one unit, 419 Moody Park Lane, were vacant and uninhabitable in August of 2022 due to the flood of 2021 and confirmed un uninhabitable by James Cunningham. <clears throat> Reconstruction began between September 22 and January 2023 without author authorization from the city. Stop work orders were placed on the structures February 2nd. 2023, an unsafe inspection was completed on 419 Moody Park Lane after the tenant invited me in due to their concerns with the conditions within. An inspection warrant was served on February 6, 2023 for 401, 407, 408, 413, 414, 419, and 420 Moody Park Lane and they were inspected for unsafe conditions based on the unsafe building law the city adopted from the state of Indiana. February 23rd, 2023, it was determined that the structures inspected were unsafe according to the unsafe building law. The mobile home units outlined today are unsafe based on the unsafe building law and current building codes. Thank you. Yes, sir. And just, just to kind of reiterate what statutory uh, regulations you're referring to. You're referring to the state and local statutes with regards to unsafe, the unsafe building law that sets forth the description of what is unsafe and for which you are monitoring. Uh, you're also referring to the floodplain regulations that city adopted, which we are a, a regulated community by Department of Natural Resources. And this property is located in which flood zone? AE, and is that, what uh, frequency of flooding is that AE described? 1% chance. 1% chance, which would basically be a 100-year flood plain? Yes. And it is flooded probably a couple of times in the last six years, uh, most recently in 2021, which you had mentioned? Yes. And these floodplain regulations uh, set forth uh, the requirements for uh, the ability to, to build with a permit uh, in a floodplain? Is that yes. right? And then um, in addition to that, there is a state statute with regards to uh, the abatement of vacant structures and abandoned structures, but more particularly, there's um, statutes with regard to the health, sanitation, safety of the dwellings unfit for human habitation. Have you reviewed that? Yes. And uh, in that statute, what it says is a dwelling is unfit for human habitation when the dwelling is dangerous or detrimental to life or health because of want of repair, defects in drainage, plumbing, lighting, ventilation, or construction. 
uh, or the existence of the premise in an unsafe, uh, unsafe con and sanitary condition. And then the did you look at the uh, Indiana Administrative Code for Mobile Home Community Sanitation and Safety? Yes. That particular uh, reference for which the permit is uh, reviewed for mobile home communities requires well-drained sites and areas free from flooding. It also talks a lot about the tie downs, the safety tie downs. And then further, it talks about all wiring and lighting fixtures have to be installed and maintained in a safe condition. And then I think the last thing I want to mention about, about that is uh, The ground anchors we've talked about and sanitation. Oh, yeah, and the hard surface area constructed of concrete stone or mesh shall be provided for each mobile home uh, and to provide a base for steps to the mobile homes or manufacturing. Uh, that's why I was asking about the wooden deck, decks around many of the units, if it complied with the Indiana Administrative Code with regards to access, uh, providing basic steps for the mobile home or the manufactured home. Hard surface walk shall connect the steps with the road, driveway, or parking lot. Are there sidewalks? No. Uh, from the entrance to the trailers to the? No. To the roads? Okay. So it looks like there's quite a few state, state and local statutes that you've uh, reviewed and, and, and then of course going to uh, the Jefferson County Courts for an inspection warrant allowed you legal access in all of these units is that correct yes okay mayor i think probably we'll invite yep mr the owner up and he can present evidence at this point in time um, with regard to the um, information that's been presented by mr ralston thank you both yeah and we'll have we'll have one more after this. okay uh mr C mr miss Cunningham. Yep. I'm Gail Cunningham. I'm James's wife. Hi, Gail. Four of the mobile homes were mine. None of the warrants or anything else had my name on them. They're not in his name. They're in mine. They were premarital property. Um, we also wanted to be taken off the agenda today. We have not had time to go with our attorney. We received the letter on Friday. We're told it was going to be today. Our attorney is in the hospital, Carl Becker. He is getting out this afternoon, so we wanted time to discuss with him. We had one, the first trailer, 408, was being demolished. We got a pink notice on it. We were told to stop demolishing it, even though they told us to demolish it. We, we have it down to walls and the floor footers is all that's left in there. They told us to stop. We were going to have it done within a week. They Did you request a demolition permit for that? No, they came, in, they came and told us it needs to go. So you were demolishing it before they came and asked yes. you to stop work? Right. Okay. And we, wanted, we were trying to get it out because people kept breaking in. We were trying okay. to get it out, and they said stop. So now it's still sitting there. It looks worse than it did before. Um, we also don't want, to, want this. It gives the appearance that we're being railroaded because it happened so fast. They, they did come in June. We got a report in January. We had nothing in between. He came in and, and took pictures. We had the pictures on the notices without permission. He just walked in. He, he went in sheds, went in buildings. Nobody got permission. I have never received anything in my name, even though I own four of them. The tenants' names were not on any of them. They, they, he had them just open the doors and walk in. Some of the tenants were home. They didn't give them time to knock. Just walked in. So uh, just, uh, just a question. You, you indicate you own four, four of the you, mobile homes. Yes. You own the trailers of the themselves. Trailers. Yes. Yes. Okay, and you, you've got a title with yours. Yes. Yes. My name only. Yes. Is I bought them around six years before we married. Okay. Is the land owned by? He owns all the land. We split. He gets the lot rent and I get the trailer rent. We split. Okay. We charge it separate. So okay. what we're here talking about are, is really the a mobile home community license mm -hmm. that is certified or given to Jim Cunningham yes, for 421 Mobile year. Home Park. And um, the statutes and administrative codes apply to the operator of the mobile home. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, well, I guess let's, yep. are you, are, are you asking for additional time to talk yes. to your attorney? Yes. Okay. Because we have, 
talked to the health you, inspector. You're and indicating you received this notice on Friday? Yes. Is that, did you receive it by certified mail? I think it was. Yes. Is that accurate when they received it? It was the envelope that has the green across the back, the green stripes on the back. But we got it Friday. Yeah. But they just received it Friday. Right, and the first warrant, they came, we received that warrant two days after. Yeah. They, they brought the warrant by hand, and then we received it two days later in the mail. So we had no, no notice they were coming. That, that one you don't have to. But on, on February the 23rd, <clears throat> Mr. Cunningham received a letter from the city of Madison describing the, the multiple unsafe structure violations on each of these units. And I'd also like to say most of these people moved in in October. They started moving in. We gave them first month free. They started, we've had floors redone. Some of, the, some of them, we have three now that have hardwood floors. We do not have gypsum board in any of the trailers. Yeah, I'm just making a point that I know I on the letter of uh, February 23rd uh, that was sent to Mr. Cunningham outlining the unsafe structure notice of violation, it, uh, it talks about vacating the unsafe buildings that have been occupied, and it also indicates in the letter that a public hearing relative to this order it, will be scheduled what, March that's the what I'm 6th. To, is that what she received on Friday? Huh? I'm not sure. I just know that we received the one that said that they had to be demolished in 60 days. So this was 60 days for them to be demolished. Issued on the 23rd. Uh, it with for a hearing on the 6th. That was probably yeah. that one. Might have been that one. We can't control the mail service. No. But no. let's uh, let's move on. I mean, let's. Uh, what I'd like to do is we don't have to take action today, but I think that while we're here. Let's complete the hearing, and then we'll uh, pick this matter up at the next Board of Public Works meeting. And when is that? Uh, that will be Monday, March the 20th. Okay. Because our lawyer has been in the hospital for the past week. It's Carl Baker, and he is also the lawyer for the Indiana Mobile Home Association, which we are <coughs> in party with. Okay. And these, the people that have moved in have been, have been doing repairs as soon as they moved in. They're, the all have tie downs. There are different types of tie downs. Some are not the strap that go across the top. Some are the bottom. They go into the anchors that go into the bottom. But they all have the anchors. But you're, you're saying people are living in the mobile homes that, that we've cited as there's, being unsafe. There's the one that we're being torn down, and there's another one that's empty. Which ones uh, uh, are, have occupants in them, Mrs. Cunningham? 401, 407, uh, 413 is empty, 419 is has someone in it, uh, 420 has someone in it, uh, 414 has someone in it. 401, 407. Mm -hmm. 420, 414, and 401. Maybe, maybe, okay, so let me go back here. 407, 401, 407 are occupied. Right, 407 is the, oh, let's see, no, 408 is the one that's being torn down. 414 is empty, or four, 413 is also empty. And they have, the floors have been taken out and replaced. They have been working on the electrical. The wiring has been redone. Water has been redone. They just hooked up uh, electric in 407. Electric company came and inspected, hooked up electric and water. Who's doing your electrical? I'll let my husband speak to that point. Okay. Maybe at the uh, podium, please. And you are, sir? Jim Cunningham. Hi, Jim. Are you certified to the electrical? Work. No, I don't have to be. I'm the property owner. I thought she was the property owner. Some of them. She's the property owner of the mobile homes. Four mobile homes, yes. So but you I'm the work inside the mobile homes. Do what now? Have you have you been doing electrical work inside her properties? Some of them, yes. But you're not licensed to do that. No, I'm not because under Indiana law, the property owner can do their own work. So you own the ground. She owns the homes. She owns four. 
There's, there's a total of 12 spaces that's licensed. Okay, thank you. Okay, and uh, I need to let uh, my lawyer argue this, but uh, at any rate, I understand the mayor met with uh, Mrs. Rowe from the Indiana Department of Health and his team, and uh, I had a conversation with Mrs. Rowe, and essentially she was talking about the rehabilitation of mobile homes. That's why FEMA, they're nothing but a steel box. That's why the uh, FEMA uses them for uh, flood rehab areas and things like that. And as far as she was concerned, everything was gold. And she represents the uh, Indiana State Department of Health. And I basically got uh, pretty much a clean bill. And as far as any structural problems, uh, to my knowledge, when the inspection took place, uh, it was all cosmetics, cosmetic driven, uh, and was not uh, in structural whatever wasn't even addressed or looked at. Are you referring to Miss Rose's inspection of the property? I'm not. I'm referring to uh, your building inspectors okay. and your fire marshals and your chief of police. I believe was along for the ride. But uh, to my opinion, I did the uh, on a mobile home. The structures uh, integrity is basically the frame, the steel underneath. And at any rate, under federal law, as I understand it. Uh, those homes are grandfathered under whatever building codes pre-existed at the time of their manufacture, which I don't know, will probably be from the late 60s on up into the uh, on up into the 80s. And whatever HUD or whatever had on the books at that time, and that also includes the remodeling and rehab. You know, as long as it's redone and to the standards uh, of that agency or whatever at that particular date which 50 years ago was a long time. So yeah. you're saying that n the condition of the trailers don't matter now because they're, they're f over 50 years old? I'm not saying that at all. Okay. What I'm saying is, is that as far as basic construction goes, that as far as rehab work or whatever, that uh, it's good under federal law, which overrides state and local, if uh, they meet the standards that they were manufactured to back at the time that they were that they were built. Well, that may be a point that your attorney might want to bring out, but here's what the unsafe building law says and why this is so important, why we have so many conversations about unsafe properties in the Board of Public Works. First, that statute defines what is, what is unsafe, uh, and there's multiple provisions in there but here's what here's the policy behind it and uh, this is what the state of Indiana says and why we also believe it's so important in recognition of problems created in a community by vacant structures the General Assembly finds that vigorous and disciplined action should be taken to ensure the proper maintenance and repair of vacant structures encourages local government bodies to adopt standards appropriate for community uh, in accordance with this chapter and other statutes and uh, you know we have we have standards that aren't being satisfied in this unsafe building law um, that our building inspector has identified in his findings. And there is some overlap with regards to, you know, who regulates the mobile home community and the Department of Health, Indiana Department of Health and their environmental section issues the permits, but that does not, um, subrogate any any of the city's rights to enforce our unsafe building law or our unflate un, I'm sorry the floodplain regulations or if it's determined that any of the dwellings are unfit for human habitation so there there is a permitting process over there and they do they do a cursory inspection candidly and then what we have done uh, through the courts is done a more thorough inspection that that Miss Rowe has not done uh, that's why we're. That's what's brought us here today, Mr. Cunningham. Hey, Mayor, I, I can, can we hit the pause button? Yep. Since I need to be here for this, I need to use the restroom. Okay. Real quick and just kind of hit take the pause. a five-minute break.
sorry. Mr. Cunningham, uh, and we readjourn here. Do you have anything else to add, sir? Uh, yes, sir, I do. Okay. Uh, to begin with, uh, there is a, let's see. We're, okay, we're on, we are on, I think, jurisdictional grounds uh, where you have your uh, law and your building code that uh, deals with unsafe structures. It is my understanding, twofold, that one, under federal HUD, local building uh, standards and stuff are overridden by federal law. Now, this is something for the lawyers to argue, okay? It's whatever standard was, again, was in existence when that mobile home was manufactured back in the day. And another one is, is that uh, the lion's share of local authority on the implementation of a mobile home park lies upon its implementation. In other words, if John Q. Public wants to put in a mobile home park, he has to go through the local, county, city, whatever, go through zoning and whatever processes they have to get the approval for that to, you know, for that to go in. But at uh, five or more, they have to secure a state license, which is licenses are only granted by the state. Permits are granted by the locals. And once that license is got, the overriding authority is the state health department. And this is, com and this is my understanding of all of it. Uh, but whichever way the sword cuts, uh, I have a feeling this time it's going to be figured out. Uh, the, Mr. Ron Brommeyer, which is head of the Indiana Manufactured Housing Association, and Carl Becker, which is the association attorney, uh, which will be representing us, is uh, directly involved with this. And he's getting the Indiana State Department of Health, right? That's which is why he found out that Ms. Rowe was coming down. And, and the State Department of Health also has a legal team. And it's my understanding that will be getting involved. So, uh, how you mentioned so, Ms., Ms., Mrs. Rowe a couple of times. Did she do a thorough inspection of all your properties? Did, just like our guys did. She, she does it monthly. She walks through the structures? No, because it's beyond, because it's beyond her jurisdiction. <clears throat> so she just does a drive-by? She can if she wants. So if she wants to walk around and look specifically, she can. But she just, normally, she just has been doing a drive-by. Uh, on you, the outside. You, on yeah, the, you, however you want to word it. Yeah, walk by, outside. walk by, walk around, drive by, okay. wh whatever she felt was necessary. So she didn't look at any of the electrical, none of the plumbing, flooring, black mold issues, anything of that nature? Not on the inside. Okay. And uh, at any rate, when we talk, I talked with her about that, she said there's about a thousand or more species of black mold and only a handful of it's uh, uh, toxic and that you'd have to basically send it off to a lab to discern exactly what it is. And essentially, uh, she said she had one community that was trying to get rid of a mobile home park and the building inspector was run amok. And he uh, cited all the homes for having mold on the north side of the building, on the north side of the mobile home, when all the houses had it. On well, the outside. On the outside, but yes. of course we all know why mold grows yeah. on the north side of a tree. But I mean, and I think that was, that was her point. Uh, in addition, uh, I don't think there's any gypsum in these things. You've got it in new ones, I had it in one of them, you had two floods here. You had the one that he spoke about back in 21. You had another one back in 15. I was forced to endure that one as well. And at any rate, my understanding was those don't even count as floods, despite the inundation uh, of water in, the, uh, in everything. Because the 100 year flood at whatever level it hits, and that's the, the AE 1% that they're talking about. What we had in 15 and 21 was backwater because the uh, drainage system at Crooked Creek and so forth was not, was negligently maintained or you didn't have enough runoff uh, reservoirs on the hilltop when uh, overdevelopment was allowed and a few other things. And then one of my tenants actually photographed logs that the street department threw in Crooked Creek and helped clog it up even though I understand during those episodes, 
Uh, there was about five different clogs in different parts of it. On, on average, what was the depth of the water inside the mobile home? It, it, depends, the it, it depends on where you're at. <coughs> On the one on, on on the one that I personally live in, it was probably probably about like that. And you're kind of up on the alley end of the home. That would be kind of the up upside, higher side. Correct, and it started floating my boat up off the trailer. That would be or at least one of them did. So you're about, but and some of the others you think it was 24 inches, 18 inches. I mean, I'm, well, just, <coughs> just for information, I'm just. I would guess that. You know, guess that again, depending on where. Now, one of them I had back in '15 was a 16 by 80, uh, three three bedroom, uh, two full bath, including a garden tub, with central air and heat. And I basically had to just get rid of it because it was of newer construction and did have drywall in it. Which you know, at any rate, so I basically ended up having to just basically give that one away. If there are uh, any questions on, you know, damage assessments from either one of those floods, our EMA would have that information because they perform damage assessments on every structure that was impacted by by both of those floods. Okay, but at any rate, uh, so like I said, in my under, in my estimation, those uh, uh, the 15 and, and 21 floods don't even count. A real flood is when the river gets up off of its banks and water seeks its own level, which backflows up the creeks and they come up off of their banks. That's a real flood. We had a, what was it, a 23 year flood here a couple of years ago when water came up to uh, the Crystal Beach. Our area wasn't even the slightest bit affected, but that goes to show what happens when a drainage is working properly and not, it, it, and isn't poorly maintained and clogs up. And, Anything else, Mr. Cunningham, you'd like to add for today? Other than wanting a postponement to get the attorney involved, but as I understand too, the lion's share of the authority of a local municipality is when a mobile home park goes in and they've got their processes, zoning, whatever it is, to go through, and once they stamp their stamp of approval on it, the total authority for operating five or more go under state jurisdiction. And it's also my understanding that under another clause they've got in there, that even if a local municipality does regulate four or less, it has to be under the guideline and directly uh, uh, compatible with the state codes. In other words, this general rule of thumb that a lot of local bureaucrats like to use is, well, the state sets the minimum standard, but we can raise the bar to the moon if we want to. That doesn't, in my opinion, that does not apply here. Well, in our conversations with Ms. Rowe, she did not refute the fact in our, our understanding mm -hmm. that all of these regulations, including the State Department of Health ones and the state uh, statutes that the local communities have adopted are somehow subrogated to just the Department of Health. So we can debate that in the future, uh, but uh, our understanding is these, these state and local uh, regulations also apply, also apply to uh, Moody Park. Okay. Well, I guess uh, we're, we have two different uh, assessments then. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So I guess uh, the attorneys will have to figure it out. Yes. Okay. Thanks, sir. So do any, I get? Else? So do I get the extension? To well, um, I'd like to see if there's any additional testimony from today, okay. and th while we're still uh, in the hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Anyone else here who would like to uh, make a statement relative to uh, the subject matter while we're during the hearing? If so, please come to the podium, identify your name and address, and make your statement, please. Oh. Hi, okay. I'm Debbie Beeman. I live on Walnut Street. The trailer park, since I've been there, seems like it's gotten worse on the outside. I have never seen inside pictures. How can that even be saved? How? Why do people even want to Debbie, please direct your comments to the Board of Public Works. Okay. Thank you. I don't know how anybody would want to even live there with no plumbing, no water, nothing. It's not even humane to me. I just, I just want to say that that trailer park is a mess. It's a mess. 
I don't know. Money is not put into that trailer park, and this is a part of the problem with people who own places and don't put a dime in them. That's all I got to say. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> I'm sorry. What was your name, sir? I'm, I'm sorry. It's uh, Hey, let's have order, please. Order, please. Thank you. My name's Harold Geyer. I live at I'm sorry, could you repronounce your name, sir? Harold Geyer. Harold Geyer, yes. okay. I live at 401 where you park, okay? I was in the process of changing that out, but if you'd bring your picture back up, the coil wire that you saw in the closet was just the coil wire that came out of the old trailer. Right? That, was, that, that has nothing to do with anything in the trailer, but it attached to anything. Okay? The outlet that was in the bathroom, I was putting a GFI in the trailer, because there wasn't one in there when they melted, when, when they made it. I was, I was upgrading the trailer. I put all new floors in there. I done all the walls, all the, all the plumbing. I have one copper wire in there, or one copper piece of tubing in there that I haven't replaced yet. That, it is ridiculous. I mean, it, it's. Are you a resident there, sir? Yes, sir, I am. Okay. Are you a licensed electrician? No. Okay. I'm a contractor. I, I'm a subcontractor. I've been doing this for 35 years. Okay. You know, which, changing which, an outlet isn't going to, you know. Which address do you live at? 401. Okay, sorry. I'm the pictures that he showed, and the, as far as broken windows, I even told the gentleman that some guy parked his car in front of my house, and the, whoever was looking for him thought he was in my house. I wasn't even home at the time, and he, threw, and he broke my windows. And I was trying, and I was, no, I'm replacing it. Yeah, I, bought, I put all the floors in there. There's no black mold in there. There's, as far as structures down, I don't see where they get, there's anything wrong with it. You know, I, you know it, it's, it's kind of ridiculous what they're doing, but I, I think it's going to be, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, please come to the podium. I live at 420 Winnie Park Lane. And what's your name, sir? Aaron Bender. Aaron? Yep, Bender. Mender? Bender, B-E-N-D-E-R. Aaron Bender? Yep. Okay. And where do you live at? 420. The pictures you guys say is the electrical hazard, is the uh, breaker box cover off. I was in the process of changing a breaker that blew. It's my understanding is you don't have to have a... You don't have to be a licensed electrician to change your own breaker, correct? Are you the owner of the building? No, I rent okay. it. Okay. And Ms. You know, Ms. 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 Gale and Mr. Jim is more than courteous. Most, most of our <coughs> residents that live in Moody Park, they'd be homeless if it wasn't for them. You know, yeah, the residents do sink money into it to fix it up, but Ms. Gale and them take it off their rent. And if we need something, they're more than generous to pay for it. They have no problem with it at all. And as I understand, you guys are saying that you have to have a permit, correct? Work on them, but in your guys' code uh, structures, when I looked at the stop work order, it says a handyman is, does not have to oblige by the same permits if it is under five hundred square five hundred dollars or a thousand square feet. Correct? Uh, you could have to ask the question right. of the building inspector. I don't know the answer to that. But but your guys' thing says a handyman is not uh, paying, uh, does not not does not have to have to have does not have to uh, abide by the same you don't have to have a, 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 a unit anymore without a dollar worth of work? No. I'm not a handyman. And I'll write a receipt for it. No. Oh, yeah, here it is. Uh, I believe a building permit was required, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Could you please uh, turn your mic on, please? There you go. Thank you. Uh, it says a handyman is not uh, obligated to. Uh, He's not. He doesn't have to uh, get have permits like a, a, a professional would. Well, I believe the building inspector was stating that if the value of the work exceeds a certain dollar amount, a building permit is required. Uh, the price fluctuates on who's yeah. doing it. Excuse me. The price fluctuates on who's doing it. Correct. You may get one bid from one person; it's higher than the other, right? Well, sure, that could happen. Well, and, well, yes. The, the come, come to the podium if you don't mind, Landon. Thank you. All that section is referring to is he doesn't have to be registered as a as a contractor. Contractor, gotcha. Thank you okay. for the Thank clarification. You. Are there any other uh, statements to be made for the Board of Public Works and Safety? What's your name and address, sir? My name is Gordon Van Blake. I was going to be the one moving into, I believe it's 407. Uh, they had the bucket and stuff that they showed in the pictures was from us going in there and cleaning out the toilet 
which had been left to set like that for some time after the flood. We also were repairing the floors and the rest of it, the mold stuff had been, there was some mold on a couple of spots in the walls. We've cut all that out and we had to stop repairs because of the stop work order. Uh, they have been supplying all the materials for us. I've uh, actually done quite a bit of work on that place. There was a lot of things in the way for them to actually take any pictures because no one had actually moved into the place yet. They just started moving the stuff in. So they couldn't actually access the walls and see what was really done in there. They did take a picture of the one floor that you saw that was open and that stuff had been repaired. You know, of course we stopped right there. Um, so I don't know how they could do the repairs without, you know, you got to stop work order and, and they have been repairing them. I, uh, I don't see any uh, mold issues like they're talking about. There was no mold issue in that trailer. I, there was two spots that we cut out. I mean, it's still sitting there the way it was. If they can't do the repairs, how can, how can you uh, remove the mold, remove you know, your unsafe conditions if you've got to stop work order? They were doing everything they could. They got people off the street. You know, they, they, they are providing a, a low rent housing for people, which it's impossible for somebody who's on social security like me to get into an apartment downtown and you know, cause you don't have the money to do it. You're living basically month to month. You get a check every month you, and they cost you two or $3,000 to move into an apartment downtown. I don't know who has two or $3,000 every day, but I don't. I mean, I'd look for the last year to try and find a place that was low enough for rent to get into. Gordon, what was your last name, sir? Van Vleck. How do you That's pronounce that? Van Vleck. Yes. Cap capital V, both times. E-C-K. E okay. So I don't, I don't really understand what they're doing. I mean, I realized that uh, maybe they just picked the park because there's a lot of uh, residents there or whatever, but I've also lived there on Saddle, Meyer, or Saddle Tree, and I was there on the last two floods, and I know that there are several places over on the corner of Saddle Tree that went underwater. There was water going in the windows and out of the windows, and I don't see any uh, but he inspecting those units or seeing if there's any stop work orders on them or anything like that. I don't understand why they're singled out when there's all these other homes that are right there next to them that haven't been inspected. Nobody's done anything about it. So if the concern is about public health and all this, the sanitary conditions and everything else, why weren't they inspected too? Well, there were inspections, and these structures are very different relative to floodplain regulations. And a permit is required before you reconstruct a property in a floodplain. And the reason it's that way is to protect lives. Because floodwaters do kill people. That is part I of the problem. And we're very sensitive to the issues with that. housing in our community. But we also have to make sure that the housing is <clears throat> safe and sanitary. Do you have what, anything what else I'm to add, sir? Is why weren't those units Check too. They're mobile homes. We're, we're getting a little. Yeah, we're getting a little far afield. And I understand yeah. that you have a question about why somebody else would. But what we're here today on is a hearing based upon the notice of violation. Well, it seems like they're being railroaded. Anything? Anything else to add relative to this? No, this uh, issue, sir. No, I'd rather not say it. It's all right. Thanks, Thank sir. You very much. Thanks, sir. Anyone else like to uh, address the board? My name is Mike Greco. Uh, I've got investment property on Walnut Street. I came here five years ago, 
and the mobile home park was uh, had water up to the trailers. They were flooded, uh, and then it happened again. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not the, the board's right to you know uh, claim whether you know a person has a right to live where they are or how they live, but they do have a right to enforce the laws and the uh, regulations and the ordinances. Um, you know, Mr. Cunningham was right in talking about FEMA taking trailers and using those trailers uh, when there is a flood. But in the context, and I think you'll agree, FEMA doesn't take a 1960s trailer that has code violations and put it in a place and use that for the residents. It's something that's up to code to that date. Um, most of this is my opinion, uh, coming from my own 75 units with low income gave affordable, safe housing, and still made a profit. Uh, as far as the definition of a flood, FEMA defines a flood as a general and temporary condition of partial or complete inundation of two or more acres of normally dry land area or two or more properties, <clears throat> at least one of which is a policy's property. So it doesn't matter if it's from the river, an overflowing creek, or if it's a garden hose. It's a flood is a flood. Um, I did all most of the work on my own with the property I owned as long as I didn't turn it into a commercial piece of property and rented it out. You have specific ordinances for that. It, it goes from being a private property to commercial. And I just ask that, that the council here uh, looks at the regulations and enforces them. Uh, I, feel, I feel bad for the people that are in this park that have been put into that position, as far as I'm concerned, willingly and knowingly by the owners. Uh, this, this didn't happen in the last couple months. This is five years that I've been here, and it's been here longer than that. And I just ask that uh, you guys do look at the rules and hold these owners accountable to that. And if it means removing those unsafe trailers, then that's, that's what needs to be done. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Any other uh, statements for the record in today's hearing with regard to Moody Park? Okay, hearing none. So based on the notices that you sent on February the 23rd, would you just repeat the request you've made in the unsafe structure notice of violation and the date of the public hearing? You sent on February 23rd? So on February 23rd, we completed the unsafe structure notice violations and mailed them out uh, for the meeting today, March 6th, 11.30 a.m. Uh, the request made is demolition and removal of the entire unsafe structure and vacating the unsafe structure. And that is for uh, each of these addresses we went over today? For 401, 407, 408, 413, 414, 419, and 420, Moody Park Lane. Okay. And uh, we've had a request by Mr. Cunningham to table action by the board um, because he's not here with representation today. My question for our council is if we table the action of ordering the uh, vacating of an unsafe structure who assumes the liability if there is an accident a fire uh, or something that could cause a resident in a unsafe structure because it's inhabited to be to be harmed well, that's a, that's a broad you, your mic please Joe that's an extremely broad question, and it's going to depend on, obviously, it could depend on exactly what were the cause of, 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 of what happened. However, there's no requirement that there's a hearing held or anything like that in order to vacate a structure. If the building inspector determines that there is something to the effect that is going to affect um, an individual's um, 
life um, or is, is, that, is that much of a hazard, then they have the ability to vacate the structure without any kind of a hearing or any, anything that has to do with this, with this body. Um, they, have that, they have that ability. On the same token, um, you know, city officials and uh, individuals like that, there are numerous um, immunities and uh, numerous um, discretion that they have and immunities that deal with that discretion that deal with um, whether or not there is some kind of a liability on behalf of, of the city. And um, so I would have to look at it probably on a case-by-case -case basis to determine exactly which immunity might, may or may not apply. Um, but those are, those, are, those are out there for the protection of city officials and cities in the duties of their job. Um, it's no different than a, you know, than, than a uh, police officer. You know, there's no requirement that a police officer make an arrest um, based upon um, whatever knowledge that they have. They have that discretion and they have the ability to exercise that discretion and they're immune from certain actions that may result of that arrest or not arrest. Um, so there, there, are, there are those things. But again, it's not, that's the vacation um, of individuals from the residents is really not a decision for this board that they have to make. Well, with that said then, what we're talking about is that the vacation of the uh, structures was ordered on February the 23rd. Is that, would that be a correct statement? Yes, with 60 days. Well, I mean, he, va he asked them to vacate it, but then there was also a um, the abatement, the abatement action. action must be completed within 60 days from the notice. So as what we have here then is uh, in order to vacate the properties that are unsafe and then you have 60 days to abate the structure. Is that correct? I think it could be, uh, I think it could be viewed as such if, if that's the way that the building inspector wants to, wants to look at it. Lennon, is it your interpretation or understanding or intent relative to your, your letter of unsafe structure notice of violation of public hearing on February 23rd, where you cite the reasons for the unsafe uh, aspects of the residential structure and uh, uh, order it to be vacated within a 60 day period for the uh, abatement? Yes. And, and then uh, I'll ask a legal question on that. Uh, if uh, that stands, because that's your order, so that stands in my opinion, uh, then Mr. Cunningham can um, appeal, appeal that order. He has the ability to appeal that order and I think it's 10 days. Um, and I, you know, if he received, if he received it on Friday, he's probably got 10 days from Friday with in which to order to comply with the vacation or appeal it. Okay. I mean, I don't, I, it's, it's not from the date that the letter sent. It will be from the date in which it is received. Okay. So both those issues start then on that date that, that they received. It. Um, in my opinion, yeah. Well, um, so is this a two-step process where he um, needs to go ahead and vacate the homes that are determined unsafe, and then the board can table the matter with regard to order, ordering the demolition or removal till the next meeting? Yeah, yeah, I think it's pretty clear from what the building inspector has indicated that he is ordering the vacation of those premises that are occupied um, and that yes you can take the other action at, at a later time. So I'll, uh, I'll move that we uh, take the action with regards to the order of the City of Madison Board of Public Works and Safety regarding the demolition and removal order to be taken under advisement 
uh, and address that the next meeting, which we indicated would be March the, tw March the 20th. And I appreciate the evidence that was entered into today's hearing. Uh, I guess we can close the hearing and then take that action. So what you want us to do? There's no action to oh. be taken. Well, uh, I made a motion to. Oh, yeah. I made a motion yeah. to take the matter relative to the uh, demolition and um, removal order to be issued by the city to March the 20th. I'll yes. The we'll let uh, uh, the building inspector's um, order to vacation stand unless it's appealed. Is that correct? Yes. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Any comments or questions? I can't really tell you. You've got. You've indicated you've got an attorney. Okay. So you can talk to your attorney. attorney. Yes. Okay. That's Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else on the matter of Moody Park? Nothing on Moody Park. Let's move on. Thank you. Any addition? Oh, oh wait. Didn't we have All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. Aye. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Moving on to another matter. Okay. Okay. This is 312 Jefferson Street. Uh, order to um, repair and order to clean up the uh, foundation that was left behind after the last demolition. Wow. So what we have is a standing wall on the north side, a half standing wall on the south side, no wall on the east side. Uh, foundation uh, goes back about 120 foot and uh, we have a supporting brace that is holding the roof of the structure so that would need to be repaired and we have Todd Calvert here to talk about it. Is this the uh, property owned by the same folks that own the building north of it? What we call the KFP building? Yes. Range. Big red. And so, um, so what what we're here for today is there another unsafe declaration of this property, and have you made any orders relative to or requesting any any action with regards to uh, the abatement of the unsafe portion of the structure? Yes. Okay. For repairs to the rear portion that's remaining. Okay. It's not in your paperwork. Okay. Got gotcha. you. Sorry. Well, let's figure out where we're at in the process. Yeah. So, yeah. at this juncture, you've not. You're not requesting that this be demolished? Not the, not the structure, but I do, uh, the, the remaining foundation needs to be demolished. Okay. Did you issue an unsafe structure notice much like this? Yes. Okay. Do we have it? No. I don't have it. And were they told to come here for a, a hearing? Yes. Are they here today? Yes. Okay. Oh, they are. Who are the property owners? Uh, Tom Davis. Tom and Becky Davis. And you Probably are? Representing them. And you are? Todd Calvert. Oh, okay. Uh, they so, are out of town, so they asked me if I you're, I'm sorry, you're, re you're, Todd, you are representing the owners? Yes. Who are? Tom and Becky Davis. Okay. Okay. And uh, so this, this just came to me recently, so we discussed it last week. And like I said, they were going to be out of town. Um, so what they would like to do when they get back, uh, we plan on uh, reinforcing the east end of the building, the overhang, the roof, uh, you know, putting up walls, um, making sure everything is secured and uh, mainly the roof there and make sure everything's enclosed so no, nobody can get inside and then once that is finished at that time he's going to decide whether he's going to sell the building or continue on with Is there any disagreement on the condition of that building that our building inspector is bringing to our attention today, Todd, with the owners? Not that I'm aware okay. of, no. Okay. Uh, he did 
to say something about uh, you know removing the the uh, east side of that building which is the roof there but I'm thinking they're wanting that to stay and then just uh, you know frame that up like I said re reinforce it and then close it and then uh, with removal of all the concrete um, that'll some that'll be something that'll either happen soon or like I said they're gonna sell the building but in the meantime we'll put a, a yellow caution fence around that and, and I'm gonna say all this the decisions that are gonna be made will be made fairly quickly so. okay uh, Landon what action would, are you looking for today And did the, if you don't mind, stamp here. If the, uh, did the letter that you sent uh, the Davises give them a time frame for abatement of the unsafe structure? 60 days. 60 days. And 60 days, what was the day of the letter? 23rd. Okay. Okay. So at this point, we're not ordering, uh, ordering it. You're just going to continue to monitor the abatement, voluntary abatement by the property owner, which is exactly what we want. And we appreciate them concerning that, Todd. And, um, uh, doesn't seem like there's any specific action other than informing the board today of the unsafe uh, structure uh, and we'll continue to monitor this and work our goal I've all, always is to work with the property owners on a plan to voluntarily abate unsafe uh, aspects of these properties and sure. we appreciate them doing that Todd right right yeah they're, they're good people they spend a lot of money in town here and they will take care of that issue so okay yeah. thank you both Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Um, moving on to ready contracts. No, nope. Did I miss it? We're ready contracts first. Oh, okay. ready. Right. Yep. Let's do it first. There we go. Hi, Nicole. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, you should have three contracts um, in front of you. They're relatively similar. Uh, I'm hoping that I have them in the same order you do. Uh, the, all three are for ready projects, uh, Hanover, uh, Madison Connector Trail, uh, the Indiana Music City Amphitheater Parking Improvements, and the Ohio Theater. Uh, this contract is for us to receive a grant uh, from the uh, our Southern Indiana uh, Regional Development Authority uh, through the Ready Initiative. All the contracts the same except for the amounts. Uh, we would receive uh, $440,000 for the Hanover Madison Connector Trail, $238,000, or sorry, $230,874 for the Indiana Music City Amphitheater Parking Improvements and $250,000 for the Ohio Theater. Just asking for approval from this board to enter into these uh, sub-grant contracts. I would just add that uh, these are part of Destination Madison plans. That's gonna create a significant multiple of investment relative to the grant. Uh, the City of Madison actually does not have to make any specific investment in these. These are in partnership with other for-profits, okay. the Ohio Theater, Hanover College, Heritage Trail, uh, HMI, uh, who is donating the lot or the, the wooded lot uh, to the city as part of these improvements. And this is the same grant agreement that we executed for the first two Destination Madison plans, Gateway and uh, Mulberry Street Arts Corridor and Comfort Station. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Make a motion. We approve the uh, three uh, ready contracts. I'll second that. We'll open up for discussion. Any comments or questions? Good job on this. I think this will be the fifth project under Destination Madison yes. that's being funded. Yes, two through five. Hearing no discussion, uh, take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Then we'll move on to pace extension 1205. May. Yes, I have a one pace extension. Scott Murphy on behalf of Harvest Properties is requesting a 12 month extension 
for his PACE grant at 1205 West Main Street. Uh, this was a dilapidated structure, but he has not received any of the $25,000 that were awarded to him. He's already started work, uh, but needs the extension to complete. The new deadline would be May 10th, 2024. I, I had a question on this, and I'm glad that you know the work is being done. But you're saying work has started? Yes, yep. They have uh, gutted the inside, and they're preparing uh, documents for their building permit. Because the only reason I'm asking is that it's a long extension that, you know, earmarks one of our large, the largest amount that we can grant for, you know, a period of a year. Um, and what I would hope is that there'd be active construction going on such that this deadline is the end date, not, you know, a near beginning date for the structure. Yeah, no, the entire inside has been uh, gutted to the frames. Uh, so he's preparing uh, the drawings for the building permit. Uh, I have no reason to be concerned about him completing the project before the deadline. Okay. Gonna be a nice uh, addition to Main Street there with those improvements. Um, before we get to, to discussion, it, any, uh, I'll make a motion that we approve the extension. Uh, and then we'll open up to public comment. I'll second the mayor's motion. Okay, public comment. Anybody here wish to speak on this application? Lucy DeTillo, 1048 West Main. <coughs> um, this is in my district, and I would ask that the owner uh, maintain the outside of the property if you're going to extend it out another year. It's not been very pleasant. I think they mowed it one time since they purchased the property. The neighbors have complained about that, and I think they have a legitimate complaint. I think that's a fair comment. Could you talk with them? Yes, I'll uh, mention that uh, when I let him know what the outcome So we could put was. a proviso. Uh, I'll amend my motion uh, to approve the extension subject to uh, maintaining the exterior, exterior appearance of the property in a orderly fashion subject to our building and planning and building inspector's discretion. I'll second the mayor's amended motion. Okay, any additional discussion or conversation on that? Lucy, will that address your concern? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Cole. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll ask uh, Mindy, our deputy mayor, to come up and talk about the review of the ordinance relating to chapter 98 streets and sidewalks. No, we're not on park on sidewalks. Are we doing it? Yeah, we ran. Yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Good morning, board. Good morning. So uh, in looking at, I mean, obviously we have a lot of road cuts and um, utility work that are going on all over town. Part of that is related to the many projects we have going on. But we also have um, private work that goes on for homeowners. We have uh, work that goes on for the city and road paving, our water utility, sewer connections, things like that. So um, we want to take another look at the process for that, and especially in terms of notification. Um, there are a lot of times that we're not aware work is going on, and that might cause a closure to an alley or a street or interrupt someone's access to a sidewalk. So uh, in taking another look at the ordinance and what our process is, um, we just <laughs> we first realized that we were referencing a 1966 ordinance, which um, clearly might be time to take another look at it. <laughs> um, the permit fees and uh, the bonding required and things like that. So um, what we would like to do is take a look at it, make some recommendations, and come back at the next Board of Work meeting for how we would like to see the process work through the planning office. So, Mindy, what you're referring to is this chapter in our code, Streets and Sidewalks, that essentially says you can't do anything to a public street or sidewalk or alley unless, unless you receive a permit to do it, and then to repair it also has to follow a process. And I think that what we've seen all across town is uh, a millions of dollars invested in roads and sidewalks, as well as millions of dollars invested in 
historic preservation and work being done on, on private homes and structures and commercial properties, but the permit and backfill process needs to be um, essentially enforced and improved. Is that correct? That is correct. And um, we are looking at those we're going to have to make a decision on what, how we want those to be properly backfilled. Uh, so we're starting to have those meetings. We're going to involve the engineers. And NDOT has some guidelines that they use for their highways and roads when they are cut into. So we'll be taking a look at those um, guidelines as well and need to come up with, you know, what is our standard for having, I mean, cuts are going to happen. Uh, lines break and, and need to be repaired and there's updating structures, infrastructure, but how those get put back together, we need to decide and that will make our road services smooth like they're supposed to be even though they've been cut and that is not yeah. happening right now. And our water and sewer mains are under the roads sometimes uh, and the meters are in the sidewalks so there's a lot of excavation work happening across town for improving you know that utility service but what it does say is that you know any utility or private contractor excavating or digging uh, in any street or alley or sidewalk sh should get a, first obtain a permit from the building inspector to make the excavation we want we've got to work proactively with our contractors to make sure that they're aware of that because I'm not sure they are because of all the work that's happening that and the story is I was sharing with you over the weekend was I was stopped by a business you know, uh, expressing concern that we had closed an alley, that it was impacting their ability for trash to be removed. And we weren't, we didn't close the alley and we weren't the ones doing the utility work. So uh, we need to bring this issue to the forefront to protect our investment in our, in our streets, but also to make sure that the, uh, there's a good notification process and that the backfill procedures doesn't result in longer term damage to the roads because the board here, which is why we're bringing it to the board, it prescribes the procedure to fill the excavation. And there are some best practices from LTAP that the state utilizes and we can bring those in at the next meeting for discussion. But, you know, until we get this modernized and resolved, we need to make sure everybody knows they need a permit. Yes. for any of this excavation, correct? To start with, okay. yes. And then on us, another yeah. important piece of it to me is the inspection process at the end. Um, when the work is completed, before that hole is backfilled, we need to be out inspecting that and making sure that it's getting putting back to the specs that we decide. We have plenty of instances of essentially craters in our road because of that lack of procedure on that that will protect protect the road and then eventually it forces us to come back in and do the work ourselves at taxpayer expense correct so I think good communication will help this process all around um, and I'm glad you're bringing it to uh, our attention and this will eventually need to make its way through to City Council in order to amend the ordinance uh, and update this because this is a, a 1966 local ordinance that we're dealing with it's a good year but pick up sticks as Tammy would say <laughs> one section here says do not throw debris or anything next to the curb it might hurt the horses I uh, see yeah did it say that it, it actually does. might hurt the horses yeah they'll, yeah they'll do that so anyway, we'll probably just need updates yeah. anything else Mindy That's thanks it. for bringing that to our attention yep. thank you uh, I don't have a whole lot to add on the mayor's comments other than um, there are some work happening on Hanover Hill today and tomorrow. So we have a partial lane closure there. Ask everybody to be safe. We're doing borings for our future construction project up there. And then we'll also have some additional lane closures in the future to do tree work that's adjacent to the road that we need to take care of. As you know, uh, that portion from Jefferson Street all the way to the top of Hanover Hill was transferred from the state of Indiana as a state highway to the city of Madison as a local road. And now we're responsible for, for maintaining it. Um, the city of Madison State of the City address will be Thursday at 5.30 at, at uh, the Fairfield. I invite everybody in the community to attend there. We'll hear a lot about our achievements for 22, but also where we're going in 2023 and beyond. And then, uh, Mindy, I, I, don't, I should have asked you while you were here, but any update on the spring CCMG uh, application and 
CCMG is a state matching program that we utilize for uh, addressing you know, our poorly rated roads across the community. Thank you for asking. We submitted our application for that for the spring work. I think we ended up with about a $1.2 million application. It's a variety of streets, sidewalks, curbs, gutters that we'll be doing um, based off of our asset management plans for both sidewalks and roads and trying to match those up again where they um, where they intersect so that we can put the, the money to the best use. We should hear about that um, late this month or early in April about that award. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then uh, tomorrow night, a city council will be swearing in two new Mass and Police Department officers. So we're always, uh, it's always a great experience to welcome new officers to the police department and the role they play in our community. Um, Carl, do you have anything to add before we get to public comments? March 18th, uh, the Wall Street Fire Department, 150th anniversary, open to the public. Be some free food and stuff. And I'm not a charter member. Don't believe are you sure David. about? Are you sure don't, about that? Don't believe David. Well, he says. Uh, yeah. Anyway, come on out. March 18th, Saturday. Have a food truck out there. I'll be fixing hamburgers, hot dogs. Be up to you to eat them or not. So come on out. Right. She's going to be there. And you're not the oldest fire department in Madison, too, is that right? That's correct. The oldest one in Indiana is a fair play up on East Main Street. Oldest in Indiana. But there's still second best in quality. Uh, well, we value and appreciate all of our volunteer fire departments, so come help celebrate uh, 150 years of continuous, continuous service to Madison, City of Madison. That was probably back before there was even a hilltop. No hilltop. A lot of horses. Yeah, a lot of horses. Yeah. You still have your horse from then? No, I got pictures of him. Huh, okay. I got one I noticed in our minutes that said that since the horse was sick, the members had to pull the apparatus. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great. Uh, no waivers on fires. Still got to go. All right, moving on. Uh, we'll move to the public comment section. Is anybody here would like to address Board of Public Works and Safety? Please come to the podium and uh, identify your name and address and, and express your uh, statement or concern. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. It is afternoon now. <laughs> uh, my name is Paul Lee. Uh, I live in 1033 uh, West Main Street. And, uh, you know, we heard a lot of comment today on, you know, the Indiana laws on uh, building codes and different things like that. I just wanted to bring to attention uh, that uh, there's an address at 1037 West Main Street. It has been vacant for several months now. And um, I believe that the building ins inspector may have done an inspection on it already. I know it's probably on the agenda. I don't know if it was done already. But uh, some new things that have happened since the storm we've had, uh, there is uh, the roof was blown off of it. The roof was blown off of it? The, the metal roof, shingle roof is gone now. It was laid out all over the yard. Um, I don't want to go into all the okay. details of all the end of the weeds of everything that's wrong with that house. Every, obviously, everybody here knows. Um, and it'll all come out in the building inspection, but through the blight and thing and the safety factor, I mean, uh, with something needs to be done with it. There, it still has electricity to the building. And it has exposed uh, cables on the outside of it, on the building, uh, where the high voltage wires come in at the meter. It is not encased. They're just hanging out there and the power has not been turned off. That's one thing that anybody could just walk up and get hurt. Uh, there's also sidewalks on that uh, property that have been dug out. So there is, uh, you can be walking along the sidewalk and there's a six On Main wall. Street? No, oh. on the property. On the property, gotcha, yes, on the property, okay. It's excavated all the way around the building and it is structurally and, uh, compromised the building where there's bricks falling off. Whole section of the wall is leaning out where it's had a, another story built on top of that and it can't support that structure. Um, with all these, uh, that that was built without permits also. So I'm just following up. I know I've been up here before, but I just want to make sure yep. that something is being done because it is, a, it is a drastic safety hazard. And since it has been vacant for several months, it has gotten in a lot worse condition. This uh, property has a history of uh, concerns. Yes. You've expressed them. I believe our building inspector has also addressed them. Uh, you're right, we need to 
uh, pay attention to it. Nicole our, our, and Dewey is still here. Uh, we'll follow up with our building inspector on that matter too. And at the last, Paul, at the last uh, Board of Public Works meeting, we actually did a presentation on blight and unsafe structures in particular. Um, probably surprising to hear that the universe of unsafe structures that we're managing with cooperation by most of the owners is over 100 properties in Madison. Is this the same property that we filed a complaint against? Yes. I believe it is. And was there you can, uh, was there an is this the Dale Wells property? Was there an agreement on certain things that he was to do? Through the historic board, he did get an approval uh, okay. to do certain work, but he did, was he's not doing that work. And the, and the house has been vacant, I think, for five okay. months. So that was a complaint with regard to the historic board. Now we're, okay, I got yeah, you. Yeah, so it's been through the historic board, the city council, board of public works. And I know these things take time. Yes. But it is, it, and I understand you guys yeah. are working on it, but I just want to keep it in public light. And there are several unsafe conditions going on with the building now um, that it's endangering neighboring properties, I which it already has done damage is reported on the west side and east side of that property damaged buildings already i appreciate you being here today paul and continuing to uh work with the city on on that matter and others thank you yeah well we'll follow up with our building inspector any other public comments here yeah please come to the podium yeah good afternoon i'm sean pennington i live in teeth 1035 West Main. Um, I live in the property immediately to the east of 1037. I've been in communication with uh, Ms. Dottillo as well as Mr. Ralston. They've been very, respon very responsive, so I appreciate that of them. Uh, the storm, most recently I could hear pieces of the roof that were in pieces off of that property were hitting my property. Um, the foundation on both sides is so dilapidated and the easement is maybe six to 10 feet. So I'm just getting concerned with if that property goes, it's got one direction to go and it's gonna be on my property. And like I said, I don't know how many more um, storms with, like I said, it was in the evening with the wind. Every probably five to 10 minutes, I was just hearing a big thud and it was either on the roof of my property or to the west wall. And you're on, are you, you're on the, are you on the directly east of him? Correct. Okay. That's the issue with unsafe properties is it's not just about that property, it's about exactly. the impact it has all around it uh, in the community. So I appreciate you bringing that here and, and uh, making your statements too. We'll follow up with Lana, our building inspector. There's so much you can do on the exterior yeah. and then to get uh, without permission on the inside, it'd be a court action. Yeah. Like I said, I've, I've forwarded on photographs of kind of the same concerns that Mr. Lee shared as well. And I shared those with Lucy um, and Mr. Ralston as well. Time, so. Okay, thank you very much, Sean. Any other public comments here today? Good discuss discussion about the importance of managing unsafe structures across the city and its impact. Uh, that said, our next meeting will be Monday, March the 20th, 2023. I have a motion to adjourn. Uh, make a motion. A second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed. Thank you and thank everyone.